Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 11 and reading through verse number 17. And the passage is on the screen before you. If you do not have a Bible, we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And Romans chapter 8, 11 through 17 today reads from the King James text. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Amen. Romans 8, 11 through 17. If you bow your heads with me one more quick moment. Father, today, God, we are so grateful for the house of the Lord, and we are so grateful for the word of God. Lord, your word is given to us in printed form, in written form, that we might have your promises, that we might have a revelation and an understanding of your nature. Lord, today that we might understand your grace, your love, your mercy that you have extended toward us through the person and the life of the man Jesus Christ. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we loose in the house of God the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch today, Lord, the preacher. Touch today, Lord, those who sit within the seats of this local congregation, those who are watching by reason of the Internet, and lest we forget, Lord, the many, many, many who will later watch by reason of the Internet in recorded form. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost go forth, and let it convince the hearer that that which they hear is more than the thoughts of men, but it is the Word of God. Help us today, God, to open our eyes, to receive revelation, to receive understanding from heaven. For, Lord, we understand today that without the anointing, without the anointing, we are unable to see. But open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. Open our hearts that we might receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. For we ask it today in none other than Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. You know, when a couple brings a baby into the world, their lives are forever changed. I was watching a program on television and one of my dear apostolic brothers and sisters just decided to turn the channel because I was watching television and that's not permissible, <laughs> bless God. But I was watching a television on program the other day and this couple on this particular program wanted a baby so badly and all they were just, you know, trying so hard to have a baby. And I thought to myself, you know, there are many couples who really want to have children, and boy, I mean, that is something they struggle for and they strive for, but they fail to understand this old saying. 
baby changes everything. When you bring a baby into the equation, it's, it's not just about the midnight feedings. It's not just about the 3 a.m. feedings. It's not just about getting up at 5.30 to change diapers. It's not about having to bundle the baby up when you go outside. It's not about bathing the child in the kitchen sink. All those things, you know, that's all part and parcel. But honey, when you have a kid... You have just made a lifelong commitment. And with every child, listen to me now, comes an uncertain future. No baby is born with a guaranteed end. Just because you have plans to send it to Yale and for him or her to become a doctor, or you have plans for him or her to become a lawyer, or maybe you want them to be an astronaut, all your plans, ask most parents, all of your plans tend to fall by the wayside as real life sets in. Am I telling the truth? Nothing ever goes with a kid the way you plan it to go. How do I know this? I was a kid once. <laughs> Say, are you a parent? No. I've got nephews and nieces aplenty, and I've got news for you, not a one of them. Not a one of them have come up the way I would like to have seen them come up. Not a one of them has accomplished or become what I would like to have seen them accomplish or become. Am I telling the truth today? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have kids in your life? And you look at them and say, oh, I had such plans for you. I had such hopes for you. And, and it's not that they come out terrible. It's not that they, you know, became axe murderers or serial killers or anything like that. But just not what you had thought. Just not what you had planned. And you remember their terrible teens. They talk about the terrible twos. Honey, I'll take the terrible twos over the terrible teens any day of the week. I can live with the terrible twos. At least when they're in the terrible twos, I can pick them up and hold them to my arm and say, all right, you're not going anywhere now. You're going to stay with me. You're not doing anything. But boy, when they become a teenager, you haven't got that kind of control. You, you can't just take charge of the situation, can you? No, teenagers going to do what teenagers going to do. Yes. When you bring a kid into the world, honey, I've got news for you. Your marriage will never be the same. No, because now, besides the title of wife or husband or spouse, you now bear the title of mommy or daddy. Now, I've got news for you. You can be a wife and you can be a mom at the same time. That doesn't make you two people. You're one person, but you have two titles. And you can't be a mom to your husband because your husband didn't marry you to be his mother. He married you to be his wife. Am I telling the truth? Your spouse didn't marry you so that you could be their, their daddy or their mama. No, they, buried, they married you. <laughs> they buried you. <laughs> they married you so that you could be their spouse, so you could be their helpmeet, so you could be their companion. No, you bear two different titles. You bear two completely different sets of of responsibilities and yet you're still one single individual person well I've got news for you those who don't understand the belief of the apostolic faith we believe that God is Father Son and Holy Ghost these are not three people these are three titles that relate to God in terms of his relationship with humanity he is the Father in creation. He is the Son in redemption. He is the Holy Ghost in regeneration. And these three are one. They're not three separate individuals. They're one God. Amen? Now listen. Taking on the role of a parent, father, mother, is more than simply adopting a new title. With that title comes a whole new realm of responsibilities. When God sent forth His Son into the world, He was forever committed to a whole new relationship with that portion of the human race who would allow Him to adopt them, thus making them His children. Did you hear what I said? Think about that for a minute. Paul talked in our primary text today about 
us being the children of God, about us being adopted into God's family and thus becoming the sons and daughters and children of God. But I want you to understand something. The baby changes everything. When God made the plan to adopt a whole bunch of us, He understood, listen to me now, that eternity would be different. He understood, Martin, that things were going to be different. One of the wonderful things about God is we get His full and complete and undivided attention. He doesn't have to devote any energy to His marriage. He doesn't have to devote any energy to his wife. Unless, of course, you're a Mormon and then your God has wives and children and all that fun stuff. But for those of us who are Christians and believe the Bible, we understand God has no wife, hello now, and that therefore he is able to devote all his energies to being a father. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, wouldn't you love to have a dad... You had a grandpa that you loved dearly who was just, you adored. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if he could have just been yours and yours alone? He didn't have old grandma to deal with and he didn't have to answer to her. How many times does dad have to adjust what he'd like to do for us because of what mom thinks about it? Hello now. How many times would dad love, I'd love to, I'd love to let you do that, but you know your mother. Hello now. <laughs> I'd love to give that to you, but your mother won't let me. God never speaks those words. Hallelujah. Because he's our father, he's our daddy, and we have him exclusively. He has no other relationship that distracts him away from being our father. And our, our phone just fell from our uh, Facebook. So everybody on Facebook feels like they just fell off the edge of a cliff. Booby, if you can just lean it up somewhere and see if you can get it to... It's looking you under the chin at the moment. Amen. Sorry about that, Facebook folks. Amen. Along with the title and position of Father, God also took upon himself, listen to this now, the role of brother and sibling. It wasn't enough that he allow us into his family, but he, had, but he did so by first becoming the firstborn in that family that would one day count in the millions. Wow. I have an uncle. He and his wife many years ago adopted a couple of children from Korea. So I have a couple of beautiful Korean cousins mm -hmm. and uh, their family, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they ever did as, as much family as any blood could ever be. Some of the best family I've got is family by choice, not family by blood. Do you know what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, a lot of the family I have by blood, I wish I could trade in for some family by choice. But unfortunately, that isn't an, uh, an option that's offered to us. But my uncle Clinton, many years ago, adopted two beautiful young babies from Korea. One a girl, one a boy. Well, now the transaction in the flesh is such that you simply go there, you get these children who have been born to another mother and another father, and you bring them into your family and they legally become part of your family. That's not how the transaction worked with God. God said, no, before, now I want you to follow this analogy today. Before I go to Korea and adopt these children, I want to understand these children. I want to understand their lives. I want to understand their experience. I want to understand their culture. I want to understand their background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to be born to a Korean woman as a baby. I'm going to take a part of me because the Korean woman couldn't take all of me. She'd explode. 
If I was to just put all of my essence and all of my person and all of my being into that woman to be born a child, she would literally just explode like a bomb. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to take a cell, and I'm going to take one cell, and I'm going to plant it in a Korean woman. And there's my uncle says, I'm going to take one cell, I'm going to plant it in a Korean woman. And that woman then bears her firstborn child, who is in fact my uncle. Now, my uncle's still living his life. He's still married to his wife. They're still doing what they do. But at the same time, the same identical time, my uncle is lying in a crib in Korea. He's being fed by bottle. He's being raised. He's learning. He's growing. And he's doing all of this so he can understand what it is to be a child from Korea. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? To understand what it is to be Korean, to understand that experience. For 33 and a half years, my uncle has this dual existence going on. He's still my uncle. He's still living here with my aunt. He didn't leave that place to go there. No, he didn't have to. He's able, see, God's able to be in more than one place at one time. In case you don't know that, a lot of people don't seem to understand that. They think God has to be two people in order to do two things. No, he doesn't. God's able to be in more than one place at one time. God's able to play more than one role at one time. God could play in a play, and he could play every character in the play and still be one God. Am I telling the truth? You see, that's God. That's the wonderful thing about God. So he's raised 33 and a half years. He lives his life. Now here's the problem. How does he get from being there to reuniting with my uncle so that once again they are one and the same instead of manifesting themselves in two different places? Well, here's the plan. If that body dies, aha, then the spirit can return to where it started. Am I telling the truth? And we're right back to being one singular person. Mm -hmm. Right back to being that uncle of mine. But now when my uncle adopts those Korean children, he understands them. He's been there. He's lived the life. He knows what it is. Do you follow what I'm saying? One of the biggest problems that a lot of adopted children have, and I know people who have been adopted from various cultures and brought in to an American family. And one of the problems oftentimes they have is the cross-cultural problem. Well, my adopted mom and dad, they don't understand what it is to be black. They don't understand what it is to be Asian in America. You know, they're white. Yes, they adopted me, but they don't understand my experience. They don't understand where I come from. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I've got news for you, folks. God understands. He's been there. He's lived it. He did that on purpose so that when you became part of his family, he would have a full and a complete understanding of your life and your experience from your perspective. The Word of God tells us today. In John chapter 8, verses 31 through 45, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. They forgot all about Egypt, apparently. It's funny how religious folks forget about stuff. It's funny how religious folk who started out a drunkard and they came to the Lord and they were able to break free of their addiction to alcohol. Funny how they don't have patience for that poor person that comes into the church who's struggling with the same thing they once struggled with. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because they forgot all about it. I don't understand drunken. I don't understand these people who struggle with alcohol. Well, you ought to because you were an alcoholic once too. Well, I'm a child of God. I've never been bound by alcohol. Yes, you were. Here these people stood there and said, we were never bound, we, we've never been bound to any man. Um, excuse me, honey, you were 400 years in bondage 
to the Pharaoh of Egypt. What are you talking about? Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, it's, it's easy to forget where we come from. And yet every year they go through the Passover, which reminds them of their experience in Egypt. And for all of that, they still forgot where they come from. You come to church every day, every Sunday, and you're reminded sometimes where you come from. And still we forget where we come from. When somebody comes through the door and they're struggling with the same things we struggle. That's why as a pastor, I'm going to tell you, especially pastoring folk in the LGBT community, I constantly have to remind myself, Charles, you've been through that struggle. you got to be patient with people who come in and they're still kind of doing things loosey-goosey and they're still not necessarily living the Christian life the way they ought to be living the Christian life. They're struggling with getting some things under control. They're struggling with getting back on track and, and getting back into a life that's pleasing to God and a life that is a, a bright and shining testimony to a lost world in the midst of a dark world. I've got to remind myself, Lisa, you remember what you went through? You remember how hard you struggled? Be patient. Be patient. Because I'm telling you, when you've had the church telling you long enough you're a no good so-and-so and you don't have any right to God and you don't have any access to God and God has no interest in you and all this foolishness. I'm going to tell you something, folks. It takes a while to get that garbage out of your head. It takes a while for LGBT believers who've been out of church, who've started allowing themselves, Martin, to do all kinds of things, you know, allowing themselves. Because after all, they believe they're headed to hell on a grease skid anyway, so what difference does it make? Might as well just do whatever I want to do. Might as well just live however I want to live. Am I telling the truth? But see, i got to remind myself, I can't afford to be like these religious Jews who stood before the Lord and said, well, we've never been bounded by any man. What are you talking about? Have you forgotten where you come from? By the way, that's a point I had no intention of bringing up today. That just showed you how the Lord will throw stuff out at you. Amen. Jesus answered, Then verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You see, Jesus was not God's servant. He was not an angel that God sent to earth to serve his purpose. No, he was a son. He said, a servant doesn't abide in the house forever, but the Son abides in the house forever. If the Son shall make you free, See, if Prince Charles frees you, you're free. Why? Because he's got the authority of the monarchy behind him. He's the son of Queen Elizabeth. Now, if one of the queen's footmen sets you free, guess what? You may find yourself going back to jail because he doesn't have the authority. He doesn't have the position. Am I telling the truth? He doesn't have, he doesn't have the ability to do that because he's a servant. He's not a son. But when the son sets you free, the Lord said... You are free indeed. Permanently, you are free. He goes on to say, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. See, there's one mistake we tend to make. A lot of people in the world love to say, oh, we're all one family. We're all, you know, we're all one great big family. I've got news for you today. God is not everybody's father. Now, if I'm lying, then Jesus is lying because he just said to them, he just said, my father and your father. Am I telling the truth? That's what the Lord said. He said, I've got a father, that's God. You've got a father, it ain't God. Because if your father had been God, you would have appreciated what I have to say. So that tells me there are two fathers in the world. See, Adam allowed himself 
to come under the authority and come under the power of Lucifer. He allowed himself to come under the authority of the devil, and when he did, he was adopted into the devil's family. When we come to God today and we're born again, God adopts us back. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But humanity is born under the power, under the influence, under the fathership of Lucifer the devil. And until we're adopted by God into his family, God is not our father. That's why we say God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He is the Father in creation. In other words, yes, He created everything. Therefore, He is the Father in the sense of creation. He is the Son in redemption. Only those who acknowledge God manifest in the flesh as Jesus Christ the man for our redemption are able to be saved because He is the Son in redemption. But guess what? He's not the Son to everybody. Because not everybody acknowledges him as the Son of God. Not everybody acknowledges him as the manifestation of God. Let's continue today. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, or that my Father has enabled me to see. And ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our Father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not of fornication, we have one father, even God. Well, first they point to Abraham as their father. They don't like what the Lord has to say about that. So they say, well, we only have one father, and that's God. Listen, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Now listen to verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, mm. and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Now as their father they would have had the Excuse me. <laughs> ye are of your father the devil, and the lesson your father uh, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. I started reading in my note instead. I thought it was part of the scripture. Now as the father, they would have had the full benefit of having an adopted dad who understands our lives completely even though he comes from a very different place. My uncle, you remember that little scenario I gave you? My uncle could adopt those children, but he could understand them completely even though he came from a very different place. Why? Because he took that 33 and a half year journey in their shoes. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Hebrews 4 verses 13 through 16. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
we can come boldly to our Father and say, Daddy, Daddy, I need your help. And He's willing to help us because He's been there. When you're tempted, when you're tried, when you're going through a struggle, when you're going through some kind of a trial, I've got news for you today, children. God understands what it is to be tempted. He understands what it is to be tried. He understands what it is to go through a trial or a temptation. And therefore, you don't have to be afraid to come to Him and ask Him for help and ask Him for mercy. Because he understands. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? Yes, amen. My Lord, have mercy. We've got people in churches today being taught that God is this holy figure who sits up in heaven and bless God, you're supposed to live in holy terror of him. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're supposed to understand that when he put that baby in Mary's womb. That baby was to be the firstborn among many brethren. Baby changes everything. The God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, God started His family. And when God started His family, he understood that everything changes when you become a daddy. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful news today? God understood everything changes when you became a father. But you know what? God didn't become a father by accident. I don't want to go into too much detail. But I know people today who uh, are the byproduct of an accident. Mom and dad weren't necessarily planning on having them, at least when they, when the news come, they were going to have them. Because uh, no wedding rings had been exchanged, and no vows had been spoken, and no church had been rented. Hello now. And all of a sudden, they were thrust into the position of being a mom or being a dad. I've got news for you. God was not thrust into this position. He knew exactly what he's doing. He said, I want to be a dad. I want to be a daddy. I want to have kids. He knew exactly what would be required of him. And when God made that choice, it was an eternal choice. Because he understood, Martin, throughout the rest of eternity, things will be different. Because babies change everything. When you start having kids, everything changes. And God understood that. We can go to God boldly because he understands. We don't have a high priest who is untouched by what we feel. We don't have a high priest who is untouched by what we go through. No, 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 no. He's been through it. He's experienced it. And therefore, he understands. It's like when a teenager goes through their first broken heart. Lisa, you got a couple of kids. You remember when they first had their first heartbreak and they come in to mom, tears just streaming down their face because this boy or this girl rejected them after claiming to be so in love with them and being so crazy about them. And mom was able to say, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. Don't you worry. Somebody else will come along. Somebody better will come along. Things are going to work out. How do you know? Because, honey, I was where you are right now once. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I had somebody break my heart. When I was your age, somebody put me through the same pain. You Am I telling the truth today? I've got news for you, sweetie. God is able to say that to you and I because of what he did in the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Yes. Aren't you glad today we serve a God who was willing to go through the manger all the way to the cross, through the grave, hallelujah, so that he could identify with our pain and our struggle and our trials and our temptations. Aren't you glad for that? I don't know about you, but I'm glad for it. And I'm glad that God 
did all that so that I wouldn't have to be afraid to come to him. I wouldn't have to be shy. I wouldn't have to be pitiful coming before him. I don't have to tremble in his presence. I don't have to be afraid of him. He doesn't want me to be afraid of him. My goodness, what father adopts children because he wants kids to be terrified of him? In John chapter 1, verses 10 through 14, the word of God reads, He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, the ability to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God wanted babies. God wanted children. You didn't, you didn't come into God's family by accident. You didn't come into God's family by some little, you know, stroke of nature. No, 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 baby. You came into God's family because God wanted a family. Hallelujah. You were adopted because God wanted. You know what they say about a baby that's born to a mom and a dad versus a baby that's adopted? They say the wonderful thing about a baby that's adopted is you were chosen. Mom and dad wanted the baby, and they went, and they went through all that was required with the adoption agency. They went through the whole process. They laid their lives bare in front of the adoption agency so that they could have you. You were chosen. The girl I married many years ago, yes, I married a girl many years ago, was adopted. And her mother used to tell her, we chose you. There was no mistake whatsoever in your coming into our family. It was purposeful from the minute go. We put a lot of effort, a lot of planning. We did a lot of things so that we could have you as part of our family. Honey, you were chosen. And she felt very special for that. I've got news for you and I today. As children of God, that's how God sees us. That's how the Lord looks at us. He said, you were chosen. I went through a lot of effort. I went through a lot of things. I endured a lot of heartache, a lot of pain. I endured a lot of sleeplessness. I endured a lot of anxiety so that I could have you as my child. Don't you think for one minute that you're not valuable to me. Don't you think for one minute that you don't matter to me. Don't you think for one minute that there is anything you go through in your life that is not important to me. I've been there. I purposely left my home in America and went to Korea and was born to a Korean woman so I could live your life. I wanted to understand. So when my children, whoo, can you imagine if only adopted parents could do that? If they could actually live the life of their child before their child has a chance to live that life so that they could identify with and understand what that kid would go through. Said he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of judgment and condemnation. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what it said. It says full of grace and truth. My goodness. What we saw in Jesus Christ was not judgment and condemnation. What we saw in Jesus Christ was what? He was full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. 
Not only did God put himself in the manger so that he could know us, but he also did it so that we could know him. So we could see him. So we could understand him. Boy, I'll tell you what, I wished I'd have come out of my mother's womb understanding mom and dad. How many of us, right? Martin, some of us are up in our 50s. I'll leave it there. I'll be nice to you today. Some of us are up in our 50s, and we are just now beginning to better understand mom and dad. We look back and we're able to put enough together. We've heard enough stories. We've heard enough of their history. We've heard about them growing up as kids. we heard about some of the experiences they've been through. And now we're able to say, you know, boy, here I am. I'm 53 now, and I understand my mother better than I ever did. I understand my dad better than I ever did, right? Because now I've, I've had enough information come my way that I'm able to kind of put the pieces together. But just imagine if I could have come out of the womb understanding my mother. Just imagine if I could have come out of the womb understanding my father. Well, I'll tell you what, that would have changed everything. That would have changed how I reacted to every word they said. That would have changed how I reacted to every action, to everything they did. Am I telling the truth today? But see, God come down in that manger, Martin, not only so that he could understand us better, so that at the same time we could understand our adopted daddy there. Hallelujah. The Word of God said in Isaiah 9 and 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is born. God didn't have a child. That child was born unto us. Unto us a son is given. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Um, in case you don't know, this passage is referring to the Messiah. This passage is referring to the Christ. This passage is referring to Jesus. He is wonderful. He is our counselor. He is the mighty God. He is, listen to me children, we called him son. Why? Because unto us a son was given. The angel told Mary, his name shall be called Jesus. He shall be called the son of God. Why? Because he, his father is God. You're going to claim his whole life that no man touched you, but that he was born of God. Therefore, God was his father, thus making him the son of God. It's pretty simple. It's not real hard to understand. But this is talking about the son. And yet it tells us plainly, clearly, that the son is the mighty God, that the son is the everlasting father. Paul described... Our Heavenly Father's journey in this way. Here's how Paul described the Lord's earthly journey. In 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. That means perfect in spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, who was God was, and received up into glory. Who's he describing? Jesus. Who's Jesus? God. God what? God manifest in the flesh. For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. Listen to this now. Revelation 21, 2 through 7. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he, singular, will dwell with them, 
and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Oh, aren't you looking forward to that day? And he that sat upon the throne <laughs> said, Behold, I, singular, make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Who's speaking here? Boy, I really threw y'all into a theological quandary, didn't I? Who's speaking here? Well, God's speaking. The one who sits in the throne. And there's only, it says there's one throne. It said there's one sitting on the throne. So, who's speaking here? I am the Alpha and the Omega. Well, now here's the little thing I taught y'all. Anybody who's been in our church for any length of time, don't try to answer a question without Scripture. Do not find a question raised in Scripture and then try to answer it based on human reasoning. No, no, no. You answer Scripture with Scripture. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. That's what God says. Am I telling the truth? So let's understand. We need to find out who is this Alpha and Omega? that is sitting upon the throne, who said he's going to make everything new, who said he is going to be our God, and we are going to be his sons and daughters. Revelation 1, verse 7 and 8, the word of God said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him... And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Who are we talking about here? Well, it must be Jesus, right? If they pierced him, and they're going to see the one they pierced. Now listen, verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega. <laughs> the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Guess who spoke those words? <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. I am the Alpha and the Omega. So when you read in Revelation 21, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, nobody else is talking. He didn't say it, somebody else said. Said, and he, and he, and he. The same person speaking. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is speaking to us now in Revelation 21? Jesus. What does he say? He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. And he shall be my son. Hallelujah. <sighs> Lest there be any confusion. Scripture answers scripture. Revelation 22. <coughs> 12 through 16. The word of God reads. And behold I come quickly. And my reward is with me. To give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Who's talking? Jesus. 
He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. This is the same Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who spoke in Revelation 21 and said, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Are you following me today? Hallelujah. Say, preacher, I'm not sure I believe you. Well, then don't believe me, believe the Bible. Isaiah 44 and verse 6, thus saith the Lord, the king. Israel. Now the word Lord here is the same word that is translated Jehovah. This word therefore would apply to the Father. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, or even his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. The word and that is translated here is uh, uh, can also be translated as even. The Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Hallelujah. So when you hear somebody claiming to be the first and the last, and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Got news for you, honey. They know of the God there, and God says, I am the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. And beside me there is no God. Are you following me? There's only one God. Who is that? That's Jesus. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Whose Redeemer? Israel's Redeemer. The Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Isaiah 48 and verse 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel. Now, Here's what I mean when I say the word and can also be translated even. When he says, oh, Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel are the same exact person. The Lord renamed Jacob Israel, am I telling the truth? So he's saying in reality, oh, Jacob, even Israel is what he's saying. But it's translated in the King James as and rather than even, okay? So he said, hearken unto me, oh, Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. In Isaiah 41 and verse 4, the word of God reads, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, Jehovah, the first and with the last, I am he. John chapter 8 today. Lastly, closing up. Verses 53 through 59. Listen to this little verbal transaction between the Lord and some of his Jewish friends. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Ye have not known him, but I have known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say, before Abraham was, I was. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passing by. Why did they take up stones at that moment to stone Jesus Christ? Because he just used 
the title and the name of Almighty God. He said before Abraham was, I am. Go back to Isaiah 48 and 12. Hearken unto me, O Israel, uh, Jacob and Israel, my call. I am he. I am the first and I am also the last. Isaiah 41 and 4 again. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Do you remember what happened when they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? And the Lord asked the soldiers, who do you see? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered, I am he. He literally spoke the words in, that we read in Isaiah. And what happened to the soldiers? They all fell backwards. The power of God was in the words that he spoke. I am he. They couldn't even stand in his presence Martin, when he said, I am he, literally the power of God knocked them right off their feet. Got news for you, children. The great I am, our heavenly father, wanted a family. He understood that baby changes everything. <laughs> Nothing's the same once you have kids. Everything changes. He understood that. But in order to make his family the best family it could be, he went through a mighty marvelous drama in which he came through the manger, lived a 33 and a half year life, went through the cross, arose from the grave. He did all this for two purposes. One, so that he could understand us, but also so that we could understand him. If you go to church somewhere and you hear Jesus preached and the Jesus you hear preached doesn't look like the Jesus you read about in the Bible, they're not preaching the right Jesus. The Jesus you read about in the Bible didn't have words of condemnation. He did not peddle guilt. He did not peddle judgment. He did not run around constantly condemning and criticizing. No, if he had an issue with anybody, it was people who were religious. Who were not acting merciful. Who were not acting loving. Who were not acting kind. Who were not acting affirming. Who were not acting inclusive. Those are the people the Lord had issues with about telling the truth. I want to tell you today, baby changes everything. Hallelujah. I'm God's child. You're God's child today. By the will of God, He wanted you. He wanted you in His family, and He's glad you're there. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.